I realized the very real need that we have and the opportunity to support students to go to PhD programs. And so I decided that that's what I wanted one of my big goals to be. Dr. Lewis, thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Lewis is an associate professor and a principal investigator in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, Dr. Lewis is also the director of the new URISE program, a NIH-funded research training program for, for undergraduate students. Uh, and she's also been a mentor of mine and countless other students for several years. Um, so we have obviously really want to have you here. And I, feel, I believe this description is just the tip of the iceberg. I think there's much more and we'll, we'll you know, kind of look into some other stuff that you do. Um, and I, I, I talk to Edgar about this all the time. Well, not all the time, but a good amount of times when I'm feeling stressed. Anytime I feel like I'm doing too much, um, I, I may I have too much stuff on my plate. I like to think about people like Dr. Lewis or maybe Dr. Betancourt who have like way more responsibilities than me. And it usually makes me feel better. Um, and I kind of settle down and I'm like, okay, I got this. Well, one of the things to think about is that we didn't start out doing all of this. Right, stuff right. Either, it's not right? a fair comparison, right? Like we're and a different. You, you definitely know. build the skill set. And I think it's also important for you all to remember that you are doing a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're sitting in a it's room all on relative. a Saturday doing yeah. a podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're balancing classes and research and outreach and community service. So you're already balancing a lot and developing those time management skills that are going to be beneficial to you for the rest of your career. I think it's... That's reassuring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah say, that's very reassuring, especially when I woke up early on a Saturday morning to do work. Um, I think I think it's kind of funny that you think of uh, Dr. Lewis having more work than you do and that makes you feel better. Um, but I do that sometimes as well, that I'm just kind of like, well, I could always have one more thing to do. And that just kind of reassures me that I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. But that could also be a toxic mindset because then it's like, oh, you can never stop doing more and more and more. So yeah, that's we, definitely a I mean, today isn't a good example, but normally we have a balance. Like I don't always wake up early at, on Saturday and do some work um, despite what other people might believe. But so I, I mentioned this just because um, out of all these things you do, you know, research, teaching, you have a, you know, a family, um, you got a COVID, a, a new dog, a COVID dog. We did get a COVID um, dog. Uh, and, and yeah. yeah um, <laughs> What, what, what was the dog's name again? His name is Hubble. Hubble. We're pretty sure right. he's 90% pug, but yes. that 10% might be Boxer because he loves to run around. Was okay. he adopted? Yes. Oh, nice. We adopted him over Labor Day weekend in 2020. So mm -hmm. Oh, right plain, in the, yeah, yeah, like yeah. plain COVID dog. Yeah, it was straight up pandemic It's a good idea. You're, oh, yeah. you're at the house. It's. It, I've actually, my um, grad school roommate was adopted by a dog. Her name was Layla and she followed Chandra home from the park and I've always wanted a dog, mm -hmm. but the idea of training a puppy while still doing science was intimidating. And so the pandemic provided that opportunity that I was working from home a lot more often. And I will say, um, from what I've seen, you have really commanded the dog very well. Like your, your training is pretty good. Um, I, I've saw like in person, I've seen the dog and also just like on zoom, sometimes you've, you've silenced him pretty well. So, yeah. um, I tip my hat to you cause I can, with the dogs that I used to have, it was, it's not as easy. And yeah. small dogs are more feisty sometimes. Oh, too. he's yeah. very feisty. Yeah. All of the students who have taken molecular biology in the last three years, so 20, 21, and I guess now coming 22, mm -hmm. I'll probably have to redo some of the lectures, but there are absolutely <laughs> there. Are, yeah. I got really tired <laughs> about three weeks into the mm -hmm. fall of 20. And I was like, I can't edit these videos anymore. That's everyone, so. to be honest. I feel like that uh, September going into October in 2020, I, like, I vividly remember being like, I'm doing a lot <laughs> during a yeah. pandemic. Everything's a lot right now. I can't edit any more videos. Also, I would be editing like every 30 seconds sometimes <laughs> with Hubble's bark. Yeah. So, so we just left him in and occasionally he like, you can see his ears on the, on the zoom mm -hmm. when I'm, Aww. yeah. There's it's, been lectures where you just have them on your lap, which is, yeah. I kind of look like Dr. Evil. <laughs> <the puppy. laughs> so with everything that you have on your plate, um, we kind of want to know what, inspires you and what gets you out of bed every morning coming to work? 
One of the great things about this job in this position in particular at Texas State is that there's always something different. So some days it's my research, it's being able to purify a new protein or analyze a new set of data. Sometimes it's being able to come in and do something really fun with my class. And so there's always a slightly different spin on almost everything. But now that we have Hubble, more often than not, it's Hubble that gets me mm-hmm. to bed. <laughs> Very practical answer. But. Yeah. Um, before I was interested in becoming a scientist, I was interested in becoming a physician. And one of the things that swayed me was that um, it was pretty clear, like becoming a scientist just seems more exciting. Like, every day is like a new day. Um, it Routine isn't really a thing, but maybe it is. It's a maybe you could kind. speak more on that. But Yeah, I think it's a different kind of routine. Yeah. Um, so there are certainly careers in science that can be a lot more predictable. Mm-hmm. Um, especially like, an- I would imagine some, well, even analytical chemistry positions in industry uh, would, um, you've got different projects for which you're analyzing. I'm thinking about a former lecturer at Texas State, Dr. Barry Strusand, had his own analytical chemistry company for 20, 25 years. And they had a suite of instrumentation but they would contract with different companies to provide analysis services. And so they would have different projects every month or so. So even though the skill set was similar, the questions they were answering were slightly different. I think that's definitely one reason why I'm interested in science, because I feel like Mm. whenever you decide to solve a problem, you know, your research question, if you do end up solving that, and you have a solution, that solution just creates five more problems or, you know, five more, you know, I kind of see it as like a a tree that branches Mm -hmm. out that it's like the first one, then you get an answer, then you can ask five different questions on that. And then each one would have five different questions of its own. So it's kind of like, you're never really done with research. It always just kind of like ends up being passed down. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I find interesting, which just got me interested in the research and you know snowball effect but that to me is why i was like yeah this is gonna be something for me because like i don't see an ending i don't see a well that's it uh <laughs> what to do now you finished everything yeah, you i'm need finished to do. Yeah. yeah i solved the world i've answered everything yeah <laughs> 42 <laughs> life so, exactly yeah <laughs> one of the um i actually had two conversations with two d- people at different stages of their careers yesterday and they were both centered around coming up with your scientific question. One was a graduate student at UT Austin in integrative biology. And he's actually coming back next Friday on the 11th to give a kind of a workshop seminar talk, kind of an, an, an involved uh, interactive presentation for you rise about the role that undergraduate research can play in sh- determining your career, shaping your career. And he, all along, as soon as he found his question as an undergraduate, and it was a very broad question, but he found the thing that he was curious about, that set him on a course for Mm. going to PhD school. And even with some setbacks, he continued to pursue it. And I think it's going to be a really great conversation next week. So I'm looking forward to having him back. And then I also talked with um, an early career investigator at another university who was working on her renewal for an NIH grant. And she was wondering, I wanted to talk about how she was gonna formulate her next set of questions and how they were gonna to relate to the first set of questions. And I think that's exactly, that that's what we do is we ask questions, we get the answers and the answers always allow us to generate new questions. It's just a matter of framing. It. I forget what your original question was. <laughs> Oh, it was just what inspires you, and, and we've talked about a, a, you know a lot of stuff. And you, you mentioned URISE. So speaking of URISE, yeah. um, URISE is finishing up its first um, inaugural class uh, this year, this this spring semester. Um, you know, what kind of students should look into this program if they're interested? Can you summarize the objectives of this program and kind of how it plans on achieving those? Yeah. So let me start by introducing the program. Mm-hmm. So. The NIH provides funds for a variety of training programs in which 
students or trainees is what they call them at NIH at all levels get stipends and research allowances and structured training. And so they have programs for postdoctoral fellows. So for people who have finished their PhD and are continuing to do training, they have their biggest set of training programs are for graduate students, PhD students, and they have programs for undergraduates. And excuse me, I missed, they also have programs for master students. We have uh-huh. one of those here, the South Texas Doctoral Bridge Program. We've had the South Texas Doctoral Bridge Program for just over 10 years. Yeah, it's been here It's for a very while. well established. And that program has been very successful at helping students go to PhD programs in biomedical sciences, which is broadly defined. So everything from computer science to cell biology. Um, so it's really anything that could provide insight and support to issues of human health and disease, the mission of the NIH. And so they also have programs for undergraduates. And it was one of my very first goals when I got here, um, my first semester, I, when I started working with undergraduates at Texas State, I realized the very real need that we have and the opportunity to support students to go to PhD programs. And so I decided that that's what I wanted one of my big goals to be. And we landed it in 2021. Uh, I got the notification on April 1st. So we are coming up on the first anniversary. Yeah. Um, so you said that this when you started uh as a, as a faculty member, you were thinking about this. I was, yeah. So I want to just briefly touch on like um, the idea of failure because was this the first time you applied to the, the grant? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Not yeah. at all. No. So, so what did it feel like? Uh, you said April 5th? April uh, 1st. First. Yeah. That feeling of like finally. What an April Fool's joke. It, it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, was, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's if right. If it hadn't come from an NIH.gov address, I probably would have thought it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm deeply gullible, so Mm. I'm very susceptible to April Fool's. Um, Anyway, so yeah, so let me go back to the beginning of this journey. So my very first year at Texas State, 2014-15, I had a student in my lab. His name was Michael Villarreal, and he was a natural in the laboratory. He actually worked in both my lab doing recombinant protein work. So we did a lot of cloning and things and expression and purification. But the project was related to something that was going on in Dana Garcia's lab and over in biology. And he would go, he would come to my group meetings and he would go to Dr. Garcia's group meetings. Like this. Interdepartmental. Very collaborative, yes. But this was the degree to which he was invested in the project is that he wanted to be as engaged as possible. Wow. But he was also, so he was in the lab a lot, like I would say 15, 20 hours a week, carrying a full load of biochemistry major senior courses. And he was working full, like part-time, but like a 20 to 25 hour shift. Yeah. Like the closing shift down at the outlets. Wow. And I was like, this guy could, I mean, I wish I could pay him to be in my lab right, all the time. Right. And to, to pay to train just like we do for graduate students. And so I had to get my own lab established and all that kind of stuff. But in 2019, Dr. Kerwin and Dr. McLean and I formed a team to put in the first application for the URISE program, building off of some of the successes that the South Texas Doctoral Bridge Program had, uh, but framing it for our undergraduate student population. I don't think I have to tell either of you the role that research experiences can play in helping one decide what their postgraduate career is gonna be like. Mm -hmm. And the Texas State Biochemistry Program has been really great at getting students into the lab as that senior project, right? But the senior project happens in the second semester of your senior year. Yeah, it's a little late. Yeah, Um, when and when our PhD program applications do. Fall, fall of your senior year. Yeah. yeah. So the idea and the movement in, P, you know, in doctoral preparation training has been to get people into research earlier, to give them those experiences. Mm-hmm. And without 
changing our degree plan, we can help students get into labs earlier, which is going to help them when they do general chemistry and organic chemistry and biochemistry and analytical. It just gives them more sense of, I'm learning this in general chemistry, and this actually means something. Yes, like, I can apply I, it. Like, I'm not just learning the Arrhenius equation because I need to apply the natural log of something. Like, I'm actually using this mm -hmm. to figure some kinetics. Right. Yeah. M1V1 can solve a lot of things, but not everything. Yeah. And almost that's everything. Almost honestly. everything. Yeah. Um, really good hangover cure, too. Mm -hmm. If you're in a biochem lab, it solves almost everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the URISE program is designed to do that. And so the the program that NIH has designed is to support up to three years of undergraduate education. You get a living stipend, somewhere between ten and eleven thousand dollars for your appointment for the year, uh, that comes in monthly stipends. And the idea is that you won't have to work to make your living expenses. Mm -hmm. There's some tuition deferral or defrayment of sixty percent. There's the same kind of professional development support that the bridge program provides to the master students to specifically go to biomedical PhD programs. So it mirrors a lot of the stuff that the PREM program is also doing um, in career exploration in material science. We're doing it for biomedical sciences. Right. But the general idea is to give that professional development, responsible conduct of research training that's mandated by NIH, and to support summer research experiences. So you have long-term intensive research experiences outside of Texas State yeah. to explore potential places you might wanna go to graduate school or potential places that, or potential areas of research that you might like to specialize in. So really scaffolding and supporting that exploratory training experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the fact that it's funded is so important because at Texas State, there's a lot of um, students with that have financial need and, and they yep. need to meet their you know rent every month and mm -hmm. stuff like that so and then that's I mean not necessarily unique to Texas State but Texas State has a lot of benefits for students of financial need so a lot of those come here and um, I, I can't think of how many students if they could get paid to do research would do it oh, for sure yeah, many, yeah. But, I was, you know, was going to say I'm you know, like kind of when you reflect on your career at Texas State and you just think of like, oh, this was a good moment. Maybe this could have gone a little better. I think one of the things that I'm very, very grateful for is that towards the end of my career, so like junior and senior year currently, maybe they were always there, but at least I found these programs at this time. Uh, the PREM program, the URICE program, and other programs at Texas State, but specifically within our department, like, we needed those. Like, and I would have said, like, I think we did well, well off, you know, with our own, like, research experiences. Uh, but I think definitely a lot more students would have been involved way earlier if Prem and Urice were when I was, a, like, were in place when I was a freshman, right? Yeah. And obviously that was the... It's attempt. an ongoing yeah. joke. It's, it's a, yeah. Um, we, we were born at the wrong near, in the wrong year. You know, if yeah. we were just waited a little longer, we could have been in U-Rise or something. Yeah, well, but one, I, of the, yeah. one of the challenges for mm -hmm. these kinds of programs, when they're funded by federal agencies, like NSF funds PREM mm -hmm. and NIH funds U-Rise and the South Texas Doctoral Bridge Program, we get discrete funding periods of five years and we have to renew them. And that renewal is dependent on congressional budget allocation and the competitiveness and the productivity of our previous funded period. Mm -hmm. These are competitive programs because there is a lot of need, uh, both for the research and for the training. And you have to put together an ex exceptional application mm -hmm. to land the funding. Yeah. One of the things that I was going to mention is that, you know, you say like we were born sort of like on the wrong time and it's like, um, like in two years, it would have been in Prime or Urice. Um, I I think I was lucky enough to be around when the Shore program was on its second year. So I believe I was, I must have been the second or the third, but I'm pretty sure I was the second. No, I was the third. I remember now. I was the third cohort to do the Shore program. Um, and that basically allowed me to go to the conference, which then I got my internship, which then my second internship. And it just, again, snowball effect, right? And... You know, you, you, I remember because you said that five period, um, 
you know, what did, what did you make? We call them funded periods. Yeah, funded periods. So the SURE program, uh, when I was two years ago, maybe, I received an email from the director of the SURE program saying that they weren't going to continue the program anymore. Yeah. Um, and it was just basically a uh, personally very moving email from the director saying like, because the email was just towards our cohort. Uh, and she was like, we enjoyed your time here. Uh, we know some of you are already doing uh, graduate programs at the moment. We know some of you are about to graduate. Uh, it was just basically like a big thank you. Don't be too far away. Don't be a stranger. Like, stay close. And I I remember reading it and I was like, no, this is one of those programs that needs to stay here. Because like because of that program, I, I'm where I am today, yeah. like basically. The short program was wonderful. Um, Ms. Nina Wright did an mm -hmm. amazing job with that program. It it was sad to see it close that yeah. that they didn't um, they didn't have the renewal funding, but we do have a new Title III grant uh, from the Department of Education called Generación STEM. Have you guys heard? Oh of this? yeah, uh, Generación STEM. Oh yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's being. Don't know anything about it though. It's me. more of an it's like Shore was focused on the academic research experiences. My understanding is that. Uh, Generación STEM is focusing on work, like workplace development and internships. So really okay. focusing on the students who would be going straight into the workforce. Yeah, after so not necessarily like uh, graduate school or like a exactly. position in academia. Like yeah, okay, so cool. Potential future yeah, podcast guests ooh. would be Dr. Paula Williamson is okay. the PI. She's our associate dean for research in Cozy. Okay. You could also invite Dr. Carolyn Chang, who is Dr. the Chang. director. Okay. Um, and so she's housed over in University College right now. Yeah. But I'd uh, be happy to put you all in contact. We'll with think her. about it. Yeah. yeah that, no, absolutely. That sounds great. like an awesome guest. Um, um, yeah. Switching for that. gears a bit, uh, I want to ask personally about um, your decision for a PhD, mm -hmm. right? So correct me if I'm wrong, but you got your doctoral degree from UT Southwestern yep. Medical Center. Uh, molecular biophysics molecular biophysics wow um, so I don't know personally that's really impressive um, was a PhD a no brainer for you was it just kind of like a, I know this is my next step in my career or did you maybe consider other routes like an MD PhD or industry or a master's program so I was really really fortunate when I was in high school I grew up in west central Maryland cornfields, cows, things like that. But my county seat is Frederick, where the NIH has a cancer research institute wow. on the mm -hmm. old army base at Fort Detrick. I'm dating myself, but <laughs> did you guys watch the hot zone at any point? Or uh, contagion at any point? Oh, I watched Contagion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Contagion. So they refer in both of those movies to U.S. AMRID, which is the U.S. Army's molecular um, biology, biological warfare unit. Okay. That's at Fort Detroit. Oh, that's cool. So, uh, so that's the history. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, the Cancer Institute that's on the Army base has a student intern program with my public school system. So I'm a product of a public school system. And um, this internship program was designed to bring high school students from the Frederick County schools into NCI labs for the summer before their senior year. And then as kind of an internship experience during their senior year. And so we called them colloquially the Dietrich internships because you would intern on Fort Dietrich. Okay. And it was always the really smart kids that got that, right? Mm -hmm. And so my biology teacher, my freshman year. Uh, of high school? Of high school. Wow. I, I oh, 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 oh. <laughs> So I was going to be a writer. Oh, okay. I, I loved writing. I loved reading. Um, I took Latin because I wanted to be a writer. I wanted vocabulary and stuff. And so... When I got to high school, Mrs. Diener was my freshman biology teacher, and then Mrs. Jaworski was my junior year AP bio teacher. And they looked at me and said after, because I loved both of them, both classes, and I loved the chemistry course and everything was great. And so they said, why aren't you applying for a, for a Dietrich internship? I was like, the smart kids do that. Mm. And they look at me, they give me the teacher face, you know? <laughs> 
like, okay, fine, I'll fly. And they did this to four of my other classmates. And all five of us got the Dietrich internships. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so we had a whole cadre. It was... Oh, now I'm testing my memory. It was me and Amber and Rebecca and Noah. I feel like I'm missing somebody. Shout out to them. If Shout out to them for sure. And Mrs. Diener and Mrs. Diener and Mrs. Dworsky. <laughs> yep. Um, so, so that was my first experience. Um, was my the summer before my senior year in high school, and so I was really lucky. And what really set my, set my direction, we, what we did was all the students that were accepted into that internship program interviewed with people that, like, like PIs, the research faculty at NIH, and who were accepting student interns. And these were like half hour to an hour conversations, right? And I had one with a, a PI named Tom Schneider and I can't remember what time it was. It was like two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon. And so I go and I meet with him and I'm 16, right? I'm, Frederick is like 20, wow. 25 minutes from home. I've had my driver's license for all of four or five months. Wow. <laughs> um, and so my, my appointment was at two or something. And so my mom was expecting me to be home like 3.30ish, something like that. I sat and talked with Tom about his research for three hours. Wow. It was wonderful. What he does, because he's still active, is he's using Shannon Claude's, inf excuse me, Claude Shannon's information theory to, we talk about this in molecular biology, to understand the information that is encoded in the four bases of DNA. So basically taking these, like physics and communication mathematical models and applying them to a biological wow, system. Really That's, cool. That's crazy. And it works. Yeah. Wow. So I'm sitting here thinking, this is so cool. I, I love math and I love biology and you can do both at the same time. This is awesome. And then I'd done the, you know, the science fairs and everything. And for one of the science fairs, my mom had taught me a little bit of basic to do some coding for random number generation. And so when he learned that I could do basic, and I mean, just a little bit, but he did all of his coding in Perl and in a Unix system. And so it was just kind of like, Wait, Tom, I'm, meet Karen, Karen, meet Tom. Wait, I'm sorry. You did coding for a science fair? And room? your mom taught you coding? Yeah. This is... <laughs> you know what I did yeah. for my science fair? I did <laughs> apple oxidation. Like, I would leave an apple out, and then it would turn brown. And I was like, well, oh, if wow. you put it in the fridge, it doesn't turn <laughs> as brown. That was that was my science fair. I did one that was... Um, I looked at whether different kinds of cleaning detergents would impede grass growth. Same kind of thing. Oh, that's kind of cool. Right? Yes. But yeah, my mom is a, is a math teacher. So, yeah. Wow. That's awesome. No, and we'll, we'll get into we'll get more back, of yeah. the but, history. But yeah, so, so going back to your question, did I always know I was going to go to PhD school? That story, I love telling that story um, because it was the start of a path that was a little bit meandering. But from, I mean, before I even got to college, I was surrounded by people who were trained and doing science and I just, I fell in love with it. I thought I can ask the questions mm -hmm. and these are the tools I can use to answer questions and, and I can do this. Tom always liked to say that high school students and by extrapolation undergraduate students are smart and capable and just need to learn how to use the tools. And that's a motto that I carry. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks, Tom. Shout um, out to in a Tom. way, is this what um, pre-rise is trying to achieve? A little bit, yeah, yeah. So pre-rise is really goal. So the U-rise program comes in kind of two phases. There's the supported scholar phase, which is U-rise. And then the pre-rise phase is raising awareness of what you can do with a yeah. PhD in a biomedical science. It's, it's raising awareness of what biomedical sciences are, mm -hmm. just like Prem is raising awareness of what material science is. Right, um, yeah. And you know, what, what are these things? We get degrees in physics or chemistry or molecular biophysics. And what do those things mean? 
it just means that you've had specific training in a particular area, but it doesn't mean that you're locked into doing that forever. Yeah. So I was gonna say I like to think about it as like, for example, biochemistry, molecular biophysics, chemistry. But somehow we could all contribute to saving a person's life in your own perspective, right? So it's kind of like you bringing your own set of cards to the table and, you know, we're trying to solve this problem. You can do this that I can't do and I can do this that you can't do. So let's combine both and then figure out this one problem. That's how I kind of think about it, like in perspectives of different like fields of study. I would invite one revision, not that he can't do it or that you can't do it, but that you don't do it. Mm. Right? Because mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that you couldn't do what you each yeah. do. It's just yeah. that you have chosen not to. Right? Yeah, I came into that's college wanting to do everything, and I realized that's not practical, <laughs> and I don't really want to. I just want to be able to work or, or know enough to be able to work with anybody that about anything. Yeah. You wow. know, one of the best, um, during my second internship, I talked to the vice president of the new, I'm butchering this, but the new therapeutic genetics research at the company. Eli Lilly. Yeah. I, I yeah. Eli Lilly, yeah. Um, his name is Andrew Adams. Shout out to him. Um, and I, w- I asked him how he built his team because I was really interesting on how, uh, interested on how he built his, uh, you know, research team, but also his leadership team that then, you know, scales down to each research lab. And he said, I wanted people so- that surrounded me who were better than me in like different things. He was like, I, instead of, cause he told me instead of working on my weaknesses, I just found somebody who was better at my weaknesses than I was. So then I wanted that person in my team. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, I never thought about it that way. Cause I've always heard the try to be good at everything and then focus on one thing. But his approach was be really good at this thing and then be around people who are way better at you, um, way better at this specific thing than you are. So you can compliment each other. And I like that. Very nice. Uh, I mean, that's an early, exp- that says enough just about having those early like internship experiences and all that. Like you're a wise kid, Edgar. <laughs> Thank um, you. Has you, have you guys found that that, approach has helped you focus on your own studies so and and not be so worried about being perfect in all of your courses and in all of your research oh definitely i mean don't look too far the acs leadership team um we don't choose the people who um get the the leadership positions the the organization does but the way that uh, i think we like to dictate uh and well delegate is a better word not dictate uh the way we like to delegate yeah right uh, though we like to delegate um, tasks and roles uh, is basically I'm not really good at making a flyer. I'm not creative at all, but you really like graphic design. So would you like to make the flyer or that person doesn't really like making decisions, but I like making decisions. So I'm going to do this task. And I think that has um, reflected in the past two years that we've been um you know, basically the head of ACS. And I, I like to think that that has also um, made us keep a continuous membership. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think our, our the meeting we just had, um, we actually had an increase of members at the meeting from the first, which, yeah, I mean, I was so proud and happy because I don't think I've ever seen that in my time in ACS since I was a freshman. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, like, pe- one, people are coming back. And two, new people are coming in. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is great. Like something's definitely working. One of the things that I've learned and I'm continuing to work on as a research laboratory manager is helping people find their strengths and then building projects that play to their strengths. Mm. So that's really important part of leadership, I think. I don't know if you have like a similar or different viewpoint. No, that was was spot on. Um, And I think the other part of it was like, if it helps you with your classes um and like i guess my earlier experiences and like kind of seeing how the world is so big and like much more than i thought it originally was um allows me to kind of relax more when i study like something that's not necessarily something i'm interested in it's more just trying to get the basic concepts um knowing that there's a whole career that can go down that area if if you're interested but if not that's always a potential collaboration in the future when i want to work on a problem that's really hard and interdisciplinary which 
seems to be most problems that are hard to solve. Um, you, you mentioned, um, like inspiring kind of high school students, um, through these programs and whatnot. Um, and we can also do that with college students. So, um, do you want to showcase a little bit about where the inaugural class of URIs will be? What, what are they going to be doing? Uh, well, I can't tell you where they're going for sure mm-hmm. yet because they are still deciding. Um, one of the things I'm very proud about this inaugural class of URI scholars, we have four scholars who are supported by the grant, mm-hmm. but we have another four or five seniors who have come along as affiliate scholars. And so we've had a group of about 10 students working together since late September on PhD program applications and interview preparations. And now we're kind of in the decision phase of where's everybody going to go to graduate school. But I can tell you that we've, as a group, we have offers from the University of Colorado Boulder, UT Southwestern, um, Johns Hopkins, University of California, Los Angeles, UC Berkeley. Rice. Rice, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Clearly there's a lot. Um, University of Illinois, Urbana, Champ- Champaign. I want to say there's one at Ohio. I'm starting to conflate REUs and grad oh, programs. Yeah. I think it's funny that like, just mentioning uh, the graduate programs, like, I, not to mention names, but like I, I know like who's who's being talked about who. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, really I mean, cool. one guy doesn't take off his Hopkins t-shirt. <laughs> he doesn't Shout wash out. it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they're they're really solid programs, um, and the fact that and and this is not new. This is not anything that the UIs program is bringing to Texas State. Y'all were already applying to these programs. What we're doing and, and getting in and going, we've got alums at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We've got alums at Yale. We've got alums at Vanderbilt and Boulder and UT Southwestern, UT Health San Antonio. I mean, we've got, we've got a Texas State biochemistry and chemistry alums at massively top tier schools. What the URIS program is geared to do is to support that application and interview process at the end of your tenure, but also help you identify those schools and those programs and research interests earlier and help you prepare from the moment you set foot on campus. Yeah. Yeah. Have that earlier start. Exactly. It's it's really important. You maybe be able to reel in more students and transition directly into graduate school. If that's even what you want to do, it makes that much easier. That's something you want. It's, It's, one of the cool things about undergraduate research is that it can tell you just as much about what you love and what, what you don't, don't yeah. love, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. one of my favorite stories about a Texas State student is uh, he was an undergraduate and then did his master's program, did the master's here, and he's now at Dartmouth. His undergraduate work was all bench work. It was growing recombinant protein in E. coli, purifying it, characterizing it. He hated it. It was not his thing at all, right? So when he when it came time for him, he wanted to go to PhD school. He just didn't want to do bench work. And so we looked at computational biology programs. And now he's rocking it out at Dartmouth, doing great work in a computational lab where he doesn't have to do anything with living creatures. I think we uh, briefly mentioned it in like bits and pieces of like basically having a support group, having somebody yes. to talk to, having somebody, whether that's colleagues, uh, professors, you know, stuff like that. And I think mentorship is, is definitely a big, big part of that support yeah, group. Yeah, it is. And that's one of the things that PREM and URIS and the South Texas Doctoral Bridge Program, all of these training programs, everybody could do this on their own if they wanted to. But it is a huge activation energy to find the people who can help you, but also to have a cohort of folks around you who are going through the same or similar things makes a complete difference, right? So... I had my little cohort of five when I was an intern in high school. I had a cohort when I was in college. I had a cohort when I was in grad school and I found a cohort when I was postdoc. Now I have a cohort of young faculty. I guess I'm not so young anymore, but I, I, you know, there was, there was a group of us that were going on the market at the same time and having people who can be peer mentors and support is hugely helpful. And that's one of the things that these programs can do. And one of the things I've been so proud of with URISE is that 
there hasn't felt to me like there was a, a divide or a caste system for the supported versus the unsupported scholars. Everybody in that room, eyes on the prize, and they're helping each other do it with the guidance and mentorship of faculty. That's so great. That's been really fun. If you can't tell by the conversation that we've had so far, um, I, you know, I and I speak on behalf of others think that you're a really good mentor. And especially, you know, I'm really fortunate, especially to have you during my application at graduate school. So I can't say it enough, but thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, I want to ask, what does mentorship mean to you? What does it mean to be a good mentor? That is such a big question. I think I'm going to go back to some of the mentoring training that we do. Um, so Dr. Kerwin and Dr. Irvin and I are trained facilitators for a formal mentor training program that comes out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we facilitate about 20-ish hours of mentor training for research mentors on campus now. And we've offered that training. It started with the SHORE program, actually. Um, and we've continued that for PREM and URISE. And so that's offered me a lot of time and a lot of like a, a relatively large sample size of population to think about what mentoring is. Mm -hmm. And in addition to my own personal experience, right? And I think mentoring is about vulnerability. It's about honesty. It's about helping others figure out what they want and where they want to go. So there are all kinds of mentoring relationships, right? So as a trainee, you have a research mentoring relationship with the PI who supervises your lab, right? That could also be the person or one of the people who mentors you for professional development, for career planning. It doesn't have to be that person, right? I'm a huge advocate of having a mentoring team that provides you with different perspectives, first of all, um, but also can provide different kinds of mentoring support because everybody has their own um, priorities. And so our research mentors want us to produce data and write papers and give presentations. And sometimes that's at crosshairs with what you need to do for your own professional development. A common case is when trainees, especially PhD and postdoc, want to go into primarily teaching positions as opposed to primarily research positions, or if they want to go into the private sector, some PIs aren't happy about that because it diverts attention and effort away from the prime directive of their lab, which is to publish papers and give grants. And so setting expectations, having open and honest conversations that are somewhat free from immediate judgment, allowing people to, to state their place and what they want to do and then help them figure out how to get there um, is a really important facet of mentoring to me. Um, and I've been the beneficiary of that as a mentee myself and as a mentor. So that was kind of a roundabout answer, but I think the core is it's a reciprocal relationship with mutual honesty and respect to meet the core goals and needs of, of all parties that are in the relationship. I think we briefly mentioned it uh, during our ACS meeting when we were um, advertising a, a resume workshop that was going to happen. Uh, I think it was Prem was, um, yes. yeah, Prem was uh, sponsoring it. So we're like, hey, this is a really good resource. Um, I remember mentioning um, that it may be hard sometimes to show somebody your cv or resume because i mean that's your life right you know like that's that's you being put on a paper for somebody it to feels then feels like that yeah. but that's not everything exactly that and i remember yeah. telling uh, our members like you know that's one of the only ways that we can move forward is to be vulnerable enough for somebody to be honest with us and say this looks good but this could be better in this way mm -hmm. and being able to take that and not be no that's not true i know i'm better than this right you know 
you know, sometimes some people may have that agenda. You know, they just want to put you down. But most people, if you're already asking them for help, will more than likely want to help. And so I think it's good to be vulnerable to be able to be helped. Mm -hmm. And that uh, personally, and, you know, I can only speak from my own experience. That's hard for me. It's very yeah. hard. And I think it's doubly hard in science where the default focus is on the areas to improve. I had a partner once who he asked me to read something that he wrote and I, you know, edited it like I would edit anything from one of my colleagues. And so I, you know, made comments and track changes and everything. And he comes back to me, he's like, was there anything that you liked? And I was like, yeah, all the stuff I didn't say anything about. <laughs> um, and, and that was, that was a helpful experience for me because I realized that I am trained and completely used to just being told what to improve which highlights the deficits as opposed to identifying the things that I do well. And I don't know where that comes from unless it's just the drive to keep getting better and better and become, you know, to make com write competitive grants and get papers published and all that kind of stuff. But it did reframe my approach to things. And when I provide feedback to other people, um, but I think learning on the flip side, learning how to accept truly constructive criticism, not take it personally, but see it as a thing that is attached to you, but not part of your core is an invaluable skill set. Um, going back to that idea of mentors, mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of peers who are both collaborators and colleagues and mentors. We wear very different hats for each other at different times. But one of my favorite memories is um, I was a postdoc and I was writing a paper and I sent it to my colleague Sarah and she looked it over and at one point she just highlighted a sentence and was like this is a really crappy sentence mm -hmm. <laughs> and she sent it back because she, she had noted that she didn't know how to fix the sentence but just recognized she called it out that it was not a good sentence either in form or in message. And I laughed out loud when I got it. And I was like, yeah, she's totally right. That sentence doesn't work at all. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a topic sentence of a, a new paragraph. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I needed it to be solid and a hook, but she, she identified that there was a problem. She acknowledged that she didn't know how to fix it, but that it was something that needed to be addressed. And I really appreciated her feeling comfortable enough with me to just give it to me straight. And I was proud of myself. I was like, Oh yeah, this was crap, but I put it out there and I got the feedback back that I needed and at least the nudge to work on that part for a little bit to make it smooth. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to be a scientist and for getting papers rejected and hearing back from referees for papers and, you know, grant reviews, they almost always focus on the negative things. And so we have to get really comfortable with, with getting that kind of constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole, it's a whole thing. It's a whole skill set. Um, but I've had mentors who have helped me process that kind of formal feedback, which has helped to give it its own space and understand it in a way like to, to kind of reconstruct it in a way that helps me make the document better. And so those kinds of processes can help take the sting out of it and make it actionable as opposed to just, oh man, I'm going to go home and have a glass of wine. Yeah. It's like I mean, I still do that. <laughs> no, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's, it's still hard to get those, uh -huh. to get that feedback back, uh -huh. but uh, it doesn't feel as, um, as big of a defeat. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, that's a paradigm shift. That's like really important, even in, like, as a student, um, getting that paper that you wrote back and, or, this personal statement that you're writing to graduate school, which that's how I was relating to you. I was like, yeah, I, I there were some topic sentences or, or like tiny details that were just like, didn't make sense. And that's I hope I put to, a couple of check marks. Where yeah. Things were yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I try. And, uh, but that's important. Like, uh, I, even, I mean, I slip and, and I, I right, still focus right, on things because right. when the goal is let's make this as great as it can be, my brain will click into that yeah. mode, the constructive mm -hmm. mode, as opposed to the, this is great. I love this sentence. Yeah. This is wonderful. 
I, I want to focus on the parts that yeah. need our energy. But so I'm by no means perfect. It's just that experience a long ago, long ago helped me reframe how I provide feedback mm-hmm. in general. So you once asked to borrow some GFP that I made in a research lab because um, mm-hmm. you wanted to bring it to like an ele- elementary school and show the kids. Um, oh, that was right before COVID. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty cool um, at the moment. And I was like, wow, you know, she's on her own time going to elementary schools and just showing children about fluorescent proteins. Um, <laughs> so you've kind of already talked about why that's important to you. I wanted to know, like, how do you even, I guess, um, get... Uh, these younger kids excited about like the complexities of something like biochemistry. So here's the dirty truth. (laughs) I was not a big fan of outreach when I started Uh my job. Mm -hmm. Um, And even now, like elementary, I'm still learning about elementary education. (laughs) This is Mm -hmm. a whole new world for me. Um, But there were faculty on campus who already had outreach programs set up and they invited me. I'm using air quotes here to come along and help. And um, so that's how I got involved first with this, uh, what we used to have a reciprocal outreach program with Hernandez Elementary here in in town. So the Hernandez fifth graders would come to Texas State in January and spend a whole day doing sciencey things in supple and in chemistry. And then in April, the Texas State students would go to Hernandez and help wow. with their STEM. They did a, a one-week science camp to yeah. prepare for the state tests. So I think I'm telling the truth when I say that the first science state test is in fifth grade. I don't think it's in third, but I don't know. At any rate, COVID basically ended all of that. Mm-hmm. But you're right that our idea, we've, we've evolved a couple of different workshops and little lectures and things that students could do in 20 minutes, stuff with density and um, light and what else have we done? A water cycle and food webs. And so kind of, you know, covering the basics of ecology and physical chemistry, things that are accessible and that fit with the state test uh, requirements. And so along with our light stuff that was evolving those programs, we thought that it would be fun to do some stuff with green fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein because things that glow are cool, right? Of course. And I think we started actually, we took those first plates that we painted on auger plates, like somebody made a boco out of red fluorescent protein. Oh, wow. And um, so anyway, so we, we... made some pretty plates and I think somebody drew some flowers with a green fluorescent protein stem and a red fluorescent protein bloom. Um, We took those to Miller Middle School and that actually happened as a construct of me being the biochemistry society advisor. Mm -hmm. So when you're listed as an organization advisor on the public website, people email you and say, Hey, (laughs) do you want to do this? And so then I forwarded it to the biochem leadership and they said, yeah, let's do it. So, so we did it. Yeah. I, mean, you know, again, it's just bad timing, born on the wrong time. We really wish we were talking about like the other night, like all these ideas that we had that um, due to COVID didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and hopefully one day um, we could do outreach like that again, or, or at least the next generation of You guys are going to be able to leaders. do it. I mean, we're... This yeah, isn't gonna not, last not here, not uh, here, maybe yeah. in graduate school or, or elsewhere. But um, yeah, it, it is a little heartbreaking because we did have some cool stuff planned with like, um, if you remember, like Boco boxes and yep. stuff like that. And, yeah. You know, it is what it is. So one of the things that I'll say to encourage you to keep thinking in those lines is that both NIH and NSF want broader impacts. So they want it's research. hugely important. Yes. Yeah. They want the research and the researchers to be accessible to the general public who are funding the research. Like we get our money from taxpayers. The aforementioned allocation of congressional funds. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about budgets that when I, you know, federal budgets yeah. than I ever thought I would when I was an undergraduate. Because the more money NIH gets, the more possibility there is that the funding line will go up and more people will get grants. So. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so those are important components of most research grants 
And they can also be built into training grants. So when you guys are in grad school and as postdocs, if that's an important part of what you vision your career being, having that connection to the general public, build it into your fellowship proposals. Hmm. When I applied to the graduate research fellowship, um, on top of proposing my project for graduate school, at the end, there's um, you have to have these sections that are required. Uh, one is your broader impact section. Uh, and you have to talk about basically how can your um, research have broader impacts in your field, in your community, in society. Yep. Um, and, and so uh, it's a high priority goal for, for the NSF. And yeah. I learned that through applying to, to the Graduate Research Fellowship, which was pretty cool. And I didn't realize, I mean, it seems kind of nice like that that is something people think about, uh, especially higher up. Um, and, and it kind of forces, like you said, it kind of forces you to think of like, okay, well, how can this actually be um, tra- transferred down? Yeah. Um, so. It gets us out of our yeah. academic ivory tower. I, I forgot that was a nice feature of the, the, the proposal. Yeah, yeah the, the funding agencies, when they set priorities, that defines a lot of what happens. Mm-hmm. And so uh, at, at the ground level, right, if you have to include X, Y, and Z in your research proposal, then everybody who applies and gets the funding is going to be committed to doing X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. And so that's how they orient their priorities. Mm-hmm. So... If you look into the, the finer details of grant proposal, uh, like the the funding announcements, they'll articulate what they expect the fundees to, to do. Mm-hmm. And, and so you're going to train your trainees in responsible conduct of research, and it's a mandatory component of this. So go do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so we're wrapping up here, um, but I want to say uh, we're in March now. Uh, as a time it. of the recording. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I wrote three, uh, like the month three on a paper, and I was like, oh my God, it's already yeah. March. Graduating soon. Um, so March is also Women's History Month, um, and this was definitely intentional. Um, so I wanted to ask you, now that you have this uh, audience, um, who are some, as you like to say, badass ladies <laughs> of biochemistry <laughs> that you think deserve more recognition? Oh, goodness. Um I'm always learning more um, about the historical badass ladies of chemistry and biochemistry. Mm -hmm. So uh, what Nicholas is describing in my classes, I have a proclivity for highlighting, especially women and people of color who have gone under-recognized or unrecognized in the discoveries and the impact of uh, scientific research. It's not all about Marie Curie and um, Rosalind Franklin, although those are two giants, right? right? Um, I think the person that I'd like to call out right now is Anna Mae Dyke. Uh, she is Dr. Sean Kerwin's mother. I've oh. heard about her. And oh, I have too, mm-hmm. now that I think about it. And so um, she was a graduate student uh, in Pennsylvania when she crystallized the first cr- protein crystals of myoglobin okay, yeah. when she was a graduate student. And she was not an author on the paper that reported the structure. Wow. Only her PI was an author. So I have the picture. I, I put the picture of the crystals and of the um, that first page of the paper. Uh, in my biochemistry lectures but yeah it says with um like acknowledges her contributions along with a couple of other people in the lab but she wasn't an author and then dr kerwin's probably the more appropriate person to tell this story but i'm going to do it anyway Mm -hmm. um so when his mom wanted to marry his dad they were both graduate students at the time and when they got married they both got kicked out of the program because back in the 50s, you could not be a graduate student and be married, whether you were male or female. Edgar's got a very quizzical look on yeah, his face. Yeah, I guess I'm right just kind of thinking. It's crazy like, to think that's actually possible. Yeah, that's yeah. literally what I was going to yeah. say. It's because even like the first thing that you mentioned of like her not being um, an author, uh, an author yeah. I was like, that's unheard of. Like, that's a case. You know what I mean? 
I, or I feel like. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's unheard of. There are still people who will uh-huh. not put authorship on for well-deserving con- contributors, but that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. And then you say that about like not being yeah. married when you're grad- yeah, like a graduate. That's like, yeah. when was this? Like 52, I think. I'm pretty sure it was 52. I'll have to go back and look, but it was the 50s. Um, that's, I, I know it's like um, we're in a different time. And back then they had different mentalities and different mindsets. But I think like as a 2022 brain, I guess I could maybe describe it like hearing that it's just kind of like I never really thought of that side of discrimination, basically. It it's is, some yeah. Sort, yeah, it's just discrimination. It's like I never thought of that side of discrimination. I've always thought of, you know, the civil rights and, you know, all those movements. But I never really thought of like. I guess like the science movement. I don't even know what to call it. Wow, that's yeah. It's it's institutional discrimination. Wait, it's so did they did they get out of the graduate program? They with did. Like they left the grad program and um, got married, and went to a different program that allowed married students. Oh, so this wasn't like a uh, like a state law or like it, it was an institutional law. Oh, it's in, well, institutional even, yeah. rule. Yeah. Wow, that's weird, or weird to me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, so. it turned out to be a great story because. Yeah, and now I'm we glad have, you chose. Her. And we have yeah. Dr. Yeah. Kerwin. And I was so, going to say we got Dr. Kerwin. <laughs> <laughs> um. Lastly, you know, I read a few textbooks, and textbooks are great. Um, but me and Edgar are trying to read a little bit more. Uh, I guess regular books. Uh, and I know you're a fan of books. So, are there any books you recommend uh, to I'm read? I'm so glad you asked. So pulls up. She just, um, yeah, she just opened I, her I'm, I'm, laptop. I open my laptop because on my website I've got a, a list of books that are important to me or have been useful to me. So Lewiska Lab, L E W I S K A dot W P dot T X State dot E D U under science history under resources. Uh, there you can are, put the link in the description. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Um but I have a much longer list of books that I've read. I just kind of put the highlights up on, mm-hmm. on the website. The one that really, it's a nice segue between a textbook and quote unquote regular book is a book called The Eighth Day of Creation by Horace Judson. This is a tome. It is a big book. But Judson interviewed almost all of the major players in the molecular biology revolution of the 20th century. So he sat with Linus Pauling and he talked with the kinetics giants and went to their labs and got to understand the intricacies of protein crystallization and all the things that they were doing. And so he writes it like a narrative, but it's dense. Like this isn't necessarily a hammock beach read unless you just want to do a couple of pages at a time. But I reread this book about once a decade. Um, I first read it after the summer after I graduated college before I went to PhD school. And it's just inspiring to me that they had technological headwinds. And I mean, the one drawback is that it focuses on the men who did all the work and not the women who did all the work. Mm -hmm. Um, But the way that they figured out how things work without the technology that we have today, they couldn't just send a gene off for sequencing, right? They had to do it with genetics and bacteria and phage and stuff. And so I find it inspiring. You can solve hard problems. You just have to figure out how to solve them. Um, It's an awesome title too. Yeah. 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 Um, and then there are a couple of others that I've really enjoyed, um, more biological. John Barry writes really good books, B-A-R-R-Y. And he wrote one about the flu epidemic of 1918 and how that revolutionized medical care and really completed the pivot from art to science mm. for, um, for medical sciences. That was really good. And then this one's kind of small, but it's also, it's listed on on my book um, or on my website, but it's a thin book, but I really enjoyed it. Um, Kirsten Hall wrote a book called The Man in the Monkey Nut Coat, which is also a great title. 
Yeah, um, great title. But it's about um, the Asbury Lab at the University of Leeds who pioneered X-ray crystallography of biological macromolecules, including DNA and protein. Oh, wow. So. I'm, I'm currently reading a book, um, The History of Everyone Who's Ever Lived. Okay. Also, uh, an that interesting sounds intense. title. It's intense, but it basically focuses on how um, gene expression and DNA has like revolutionized our understanding for like human civilization. And um, the author is known for making um, his science based books um, com comedic. So there's humor in the book, uh, which I enjoy a lot. Um, but it's, it's a very good book. Um, and I've always found myself thinking like, yeah, how did yeah how did they know this? Like when they didn't have the technology we have today, right? And he uh, basically explains how um, how we look at the DNA in bones and how we look at the DNA um, in teeth and how that was used to basically start mapping out where we came from. You know, who's our quote unquote like um, like cousins? You know, and it talks about like the Neanderthals and then other. Um, types of humans who were discovered in caves and then predates them and stuff like that. I'm currently in the section where he's talking about um, like monarchies and how those became to be and, you know, how that relates to our um, ancient, ancient uh, civilizations. And it, it's a very interesting book, but it, the the focal point of it is gene expression and DNA wow. and how that's used to map out our life. Sounds like molecular anthropology. Yeah, yeah it's, ve fun. it's very it's a very cool book. Yeah, and then to give some some room to women as well, um, as Kirsten Hall's book, um, if y'all haven't read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, you really ought to. Yeah. And Lab Girl by Hope Jaren. It, she's not a biomedical scientist. She's a plant biologist and analytical chemist. But her memoir, Lab Girl, was it gave me a lot of feels. Mm -hmm. It is really good. What, what were the names? Lab Girl. Mm -hmm. By Hope Jaren, J A H R E N, and The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot, S K L O O T. Mm. Henrietta Lacks is, was the woman in Baltimore from whom her cervical cancer cells were harvested without her consent and used to make the HeLa cell line. Oh, so the I first think, yeah. immortalized cell line, mammalian human cell line. So we were talking about discrimination and right, yeah. institutional issues, the issue of consent yeah. and seeing patients as um, experiments. Yeah. Versus, versus autonomous individuals yeah. with choice and power. That's Reason. another mind blowing book that I've actually read. And that's really yeah. good. I'll add one more to the, to, to this list of books about, you know, or from women, um, a crack in creation by Jennifer Dudno. It's um, she's one of the co-inventors of the CRISPR technology, and she basically wrote a book about CRISPR, but also about how she found um, herself in the career and talked about her story. And um, I would actually say it was one of the most influential books that I read, which I guess isn't many books, but that book definitely influenced my interest in, in becoming a scientist, it's like reading about her story. And then obviously CRISPR is like super cool and she was able to talk about it in a book with very little figures uh, very eloquently to the extent that I could actually understand it. Um, so would also recommend that book, for okay. especially any undergraduate um, like biochemistry or, or anyone wants to become a scientist, really. Nice. I haven't, I haven't read any of Jennifer Dowdo's books, but she is a co-author of our yeah, molecular and biology. And textbook too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so I watched this podcast um, from True Jordy, that's his name. And every guest that he has on, um, he always ends the um, episode by asking this question. And it's basically asked in every episode. And I thought to myself when I was watching one episode, this is really interesting how different people and their different personalities and just life in general, how they answer this question. And it's very different. Um, and so... I'm going to steal it a little bit. Hopefully we don't get copyright or anything like that. I'm sure he doesn't even know well, you my gave him a shout out, so that's Yeah, okay. he doesn't even know my existence. But the question is, how would you like to be remembered? And I know that's a really deep question, so you're welcome to answer it in the most simple way possible or 
you know you can go as in depth as in depth as you want. Uh, but I really like that question because I feel like that encomp- encompasses a lot of what that person is. So how would you like to be remembered? Well, on the spot. Um, <laughs> I once did an exercise uh, in a workshop about, you know, what would you want your obituary to say? What would you want your tombstone to say? Um, and I think I would like it, I would like to be remembered as someone who cared who cared about making the world better, who cared about individuals, who cared about the things that she chose to put her efforts into. I think that's a great answer. Because that I, answer. I think because of people caring is how we just move forward. Because people care of this issue or this conflict or this person in need is how then solutions and problems come about and then just society keeps moving forward. But you have to care. Yeah, apathy never solved anything. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lewis, this is probably one of my favorite podcasts, I gotta say. Um, thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. Um, thank you really for having me. It. No problem. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Oh, good. Cool.